So hello everyone, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending uh, on uh, where you are today. Welcome to this uh, post-council uh, press conference being uh, streamed live in uh, FIFA.com and in uh, FIFA YouTube uh, channel in uh, four languages, English, French, Spanish and German. Given the important news that uh, we just announced on the hosts of the uh, FIFA Women's World Cup uh, 2023, we will have a first part of this uh, press conference exclusively dedicated to the Women's World Cup and to women's football. And then we will proceed to the other topics uh, of the agenda of today's Council. So without further ado, I would uh, invite the FIFA president, Gianni Infantino, to give us some initial thoughts on this very important decision taken today. Thank you very much, Onofre. Welcome to all of you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, as it was already said. Depending on where you are around the world, it's a pleasure to uh, see that many of you are following what we are doing. and. Uh, uh, Today, I'm very pleased to report as well on um, the outcome of uh, the bidding process for the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023. As uh, you have already been informed through uh, the press release which, which went out, the FIFA Council decided to award the hosting of this World Cup to Australia and New Zealand. So obviously, my first congratulations go to Australia and New Zealand. At the same time, though, I would like to congratulate as well uh, Colombia, who has put forward a very competitive bid as well, and uh, has been, of course, a tough opponent for Australia and New Zealand, that is sport. We move forward and we have and will organize, of course, the best ever World Cup in 2023, best ever Women's World Cup in 2023 in Australia and in New Zealand. This is our ambition. And this comes as well from uh, the success of the last World Cup in uh, uh, France, which was uh, Unique, I said it a few times already, there is for women's football in general, not only for the World Cup, a before and an after World Cup 2019 in terms of the impact that this has had. One million spectators, more than one million in the stadiums, one billion around the world, a huge, huge, huge uh, success uh, everywhere. everywhere. And uh, uh, we want to build, of course, on that by some projects which uh, we have been uh, informing you uh, in the last periods and some maybe new ideas or new projects. But for the moment, really congratulations uh, to the winners, congratulations to all the bidders and thanks for expressing interest to those who finally did not uh, bid. My thanks as well to the council members for their participation and my thanks also to the FIFA administration for the work carried out. I would like just to stress one uh, particular thing in this respect, which is that uh, um, FIFA, but I would go beyond FIFA, it's up to you to uh, uh, decide how much beyond, but I would think quite a lot beyond, has uh, brought forward in this process a completely transparent and professional bidding process. We did it already for the Men's World Cup in uh, uh, 2018, for the Men's World Cup 2026. 20, we repeated it now for the Women's World Cup 2023 with uh, the publication of everything, with an independent audit, uh, with uh, all the results being transparent, being opened, being clear. This is the FIFA, the new FIFA that we want, this is the new FIFA that we stand for, and I think that this process, which uh, would not have been a success without the help of everyone who was involved, starting from the bidders and to everyone else, uh, would not have been uh, that successful. So again, my thanks uh, to everyone, and uh, we need definitely to continue on 
this path. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, have um, the opportunity uh, to hear a reaction from the winning bid, so I would like to give the floor to the president of uh, the New Zealand Football and FIFA Council member, Joanna Wood. Hello, Joanna. Do you hear us? Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Congratulations. Thank could, you. could you give us your views and, on this decision and uh, your expectations moving forward, please? Uh, look, I, I think uh, I know that Chris and I and the whole bidding team are extremely delighted with the result. Uh, well, it's the middle of the night for us, so uh, we are absolutely delighted with the result. Um, we, we acknowledge our um, competitors in the bid uh, who, who gave us a good run for our money. Um, but I think what I'd like to say is that we, we've always said that with this bid that it's the as one and it's together and it's about making history and creating opportunities and we're committed uh, to do that as we progress towards 2023. Um, Chris mentioned when he spoke to the council about the gift that we've been given, we would say that uh, we've been given a taonga, a treasure, and so we will look after the treasure and we will work towards making uh, or, or having women's football even more front and centre uh, on the world stage. That's our commitment and we'll do that together as a team. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge our bidding team because they've worked tirelessly for many, many months. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge our governments for their support and our uh, our, our national governments, our state um, governments, and our local um, gov central government, local governments here in New Zealand. So, together as one, we've created history by having a cross, con cross confederation bid, um, and now we have a job to um, make this next edition of the FIFA Women's World Cup the best that it's ever been. Kia ora Thank you very much. So now let's go to Australia to hear from the chairman of uh, Football Federation Australia, Chris uh, Niku. Do you hear us, uh, Chris? I do. Congratulations. Yeah. Please, Mr. President, go ahead. We're very pleased that today FIFA Council has made not one but two countries extremely happy uh, and our football families here are rejoicing. We are pleased with what we have been given. We know there is work to be done, but our, our pledge to the FIFA family is that we will leave no stone unturned to produce the best Women's World Cup and to help FIFA meet its objectives around the women's game globally and, and more immediately in the Asia Pacific region. I echo what Joanna said about our bid team, an immense effort. Um, the other countries that bid we have we are respected we respect them they are wonderful countries of the fifa family and we're very grateful to to ultimately be uh, successful tonight thank you very much uh, to both of you for having uh, participated uh, in this uh, press conference uh, now we're going to start uh, the session of questions for uh, the fifa president Again, uh, reminding everyone that uh, this uh, first part is exclusively dedicated to uh, FIFA Women's World Cup and uh, women's football. Um, and we also have in the room the FIFA General Secretary Fatma Samora and uh, uh, FIFA um, uh, Tournaments and Events uh, Chief Officer Colin Smith, uh, in case there are more uh, specific and technical uh, questions to be addressed. So, according to uh, my list here, we have a request coming from Australia, Tracy Holmes. Tracy, do you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, ahead of the vote, UEFA allegedly called the FIFA 2023 Women's World Cup a development tournament. Is that how FIFA sees it? And now that Australia New Zealand has won, how will it help uh, FIFA reach the target of doubling the number of women who play the game to 60 million? How many uh, inhabitants does uh, Australia have and New Zealand together? And <laughs> if everyone plays uh, football, we might uh, 
reach than this uh, this um, figure of 60 million. But jo jokes aside, obviously, um, it is not a development tournament. Obviously, it is not a development tournament. Uh, I said it, we had an extremely successful uh, World Cup last year in France, which is also the reason why we waited until the end of that World Cup uh, to, of course, uh, go ahead with the bidding process for the next World Cup, because we were sure that France would set new benchmarks in uh, women's football. We have seen with this uh, Women's World Cup that it's not just a Women's World Cup, it's a World Cup. We need to realize that. Women are 50% of the world population, maybe even a bit more. Uh, and uh, um, women's football is today a very, very attractive sport. It is football. Many people who tuned in for the first time during the Women's World Cup in France last year, they realized that actually, well, what is played, what is presented on the pitch is football with skilled football players. And uh, everything that goes around it uh, with uh, TV viewership, with uh, uh, stadium attendances and so on shows us that an event like the World Cup is is something unique. It is, uh, after the Men's World Cup, the biggest sporting event uh, of one single sport generally around the world. And we need to build on that. And that's why we don't want just to sit and wait until 2023, uh, because we have ambitious targets in terms of uh, uh, not only doubling the number of um, uh, women and girls playing football, but uh, we want to make it really part of society. We want women's football to be part of society. And for this, we have launched some ideas, some projects, maybe we mentioned some of them a bit later, but uh, uh, it doesn't certainly stop with this Women's World Cup. The Women's World Cup in 2023 is certainly an important milestone for us. The fact that it will be played for the first time in the Southern Hemisphere, in, in um, uh, the Asia Pacific region, across two confederations, is an important uh, element of this development as well. But we need to develop it all over the world. So Australia, New Zealand will play an important part in this, but the entire world and FIFA will work together in this respect. We also have a request from uh, New Zealand, uh, Michael Burgess, uh, Herald on Sunday. Uh, do you hear us, Michael? Yes, I do, thank you. Please go ahead, ask your question. Thank you. My question is for the FIFA president. Um, Mr. President, uh, there's two parts. What do you think this result means for football in uh, the Asia-Pacific Asia, Asia, the Asia region, but especially football in Oceania? We know you visited uh, New Zealand last year. And the second part, for you, what were the key things that you personally thought were the most positive about the Australia and New Zealand bid that's made it successful? Uh, well, thank you very much for, for your questions. Um, I think that uh, this World Cup will, uh, uh, will be very, very important for, for the whole region. Um, it's the first time a major tournament, because I repeat, it's not a development tournament. It's the contrary of that. It is a major FIFA tournament. will take place in uh, Oceania as well, right, in, in New Zealand. I've, visited uh, uh, New Zealand, even if just shortly, so I will, uh, I'm looking forward to be there for a bit longer next time. Um, and I have been able to witness uh, uh, myself the enthusiasm of, uh, of, uh, of the people for, for football generally, not only New Zealand, but the whole of, of Oceania, the whole of the Asia Pacific region. I think we have seen as well in the last World Cup, um, some games I've seen uh, games of the of the uh, um, of, of New Zealand, games of um, uh, Australia, as well with uh, a lot of enthusiasm, full stadiums, and I think we want to repeat this for the World Cup. Now, as I was saying before, the World Cup will take place in three years from now, which on one side is uh, seems maybe long, but on the other side it's very short. So we need to work hard immediately to raise the awareness of women's football 
in uh, these countries, but all over the world, because let's not forget that there are eight more countries participating, 32 participants instead of 24, compared to France, which means when you host such an event or when you qualify for such an event, this is the biggest boost for um, football and for women's football. So we'll work on that, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have the best World Cup ever in Australia and New Zealand. A question from Australia again, Thomas Smithis, the Daily Telegraph. Thomas, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. I don't know if Thomas is on mute or not. If, if you are, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Uh, no, you, sorry, but your, your sound is not very good. You're too far away for us to be able to hear you. Can you please speak up or closer to a microphone if you have? So we try to go back to you. Um, hopefully the next uh, question is ready from Eric Bernardo, Agence France Presse. Eric, do you hear us? Hello, Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Well, good evening, President. Uh, my question will be on, on the vote uh, tonight or today. Uh, it was not a unanimous vote uh, in favor of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, uh, there was a, a block vote uh, for Colombia from UEFA. How did you, uh, what's your analysis, President, of this vote? What does it mean for you? <laughs> it means that uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand has won uh, the right to organize uh, the Women's World Cup 2023 by 22 votes to 13, I think. Everyone is, of course, free to vote. Uh, uh, this is democracy, and at the end, uh, uh, the votes decide. Everyone has to uh, analyze uh, what is presented to him based on his own conscience. Uh, the report is one element. There are certainly other elements as well, which guide people to take decisions. Uh, I believe maybe for the future we should uh, bring, and I mentioned this to the council members earlier as well, and to the Confederation's presidents yesterday, we should bring maybe this decision as well to the FIFA Congress um, to decide, because uh, there is no reason to treat men and women differently, why the men's World Cup has to be decided by the counts, by the Congress, sorry, and the women's World Cup by the Council doesn't really make much sense to me. We can have a more democratic process, even by involving the Congress, the member associations of uh, FIFA. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, I think this is uh, this is certainly something we need to consider and think about for the future. Uh, for the analysis, I think you can make your own analysis. Uh, I'm happy that the process, and that's why we are here, and that's what we stand for, that the process until the vote has been done in a professional way, uh, in a transparent way, um, in a way that was never, ever done before. And uh, this has to be recognized. I'm happy for that. Then everyone votes, of course, as he wants. It's his, it's his right. Thank you. Next question in line, Graham Dunbar, Associated Press. Graham, can you hear us? I can. Uh, I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, for sure. Uh, go, go ahead, please. Yeah, a question, please, about the, um, the commercial prospects for this tournament and what your targets or expectations are for making progress towards the Women's World Cup standing alone with its own commercial deals, raising its own revenue, and maybe one day that driving up the prize money. I mean, and also you judged it as the low risk option, given that seven of the eight quarter finalists last year were from Europe. What do you see as the challenges with Europe engaging with these time zones? Well, I think when it comes to, to Europe, 
uh, and the time zones, it would have been uh, probably a similar challenge one way or the other. Um, we have to recognize that football and women's football is very, very important in Europe, thanks to the big, big work that uh, Europe has done in this, in this respect in the last uh, uh, decade or so. Um, we need, though, uh, as well as FIFA in particular, to uh, make sure that we boost and not develop, I want to repeat that, it's not about developing women's football, it's about boosting women's football all over the world. And uh, that's why the Asia-Pacific region is an important uh, part. South America with Colombia would have been equally important as well, and we need to think on initiatives uh, there as well, as well as, as Africa. We have seen some teams uh, performing at the, last, uh, at the last World Cup. Now, I hope that we can uh, generate more revenues. We are, though, and our hands are uh, still a bit uh, tied up by old contracts, um, which were done by the old FIFA, in which kind of, you know, everything, but you know these stories better than me, everything was included, or let's say it like this, uh, the Men's World Cup was in, and everything else was given as a gift. Uh, so as soon as we get out of these contracts, and for unfortunately the vast majority of them, this is not yet the case for 2023, uh, but as soon as we can get out of these contracts for uh, future events around women's football, which can be the World Cup, which can be also other events, um, we will be able to commercialize them. I already said last year that my ambition, our ambition would be to uh, that more than double, at least double, the prize money. Now, I just would like to remind that uh, in 2015, in Canada, the prize money was 15 million. In 2019, in France, it was 50, 30 prize money, uh, eight and a half uh, um, particip um, preparation costs, and 11 and a half, I'm looking at Valdma here, and 11 and a half for uh, the clubs as well who have contributed to this. So more than double. We want to double this amount as well. We are investing into women's football in the next four years, one billion US dollars. I had proposed as well to think about uh, uh, a club World Cup for women or a Nations League for women. We have increased the number of teams from 32 from, sorry, 24 to, to 32 for the World Cup in, uh, in 2023. But maybe, maybe you know, uh, from all of these uh, proposals that I made, I made five proposals last year, uh, maybe actually the sixth proposal is the best one. And it was not from me, so we have to leave to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. It was proposed in the press, in the press conference, so it's, it's obviously public by the president of the French Football Federation, uh, who said, well, the Women's World Cup should take place every two years rather than every four years, because we need to boost women's football, and there is nothing more important than organizing such a World Cup, in addition to participating, of course, than uh, in order to boost football. And he was saying this, of course, uh, bearing in mind his experience in organizing and hosting the Women's World Cup there. So maybe this is something that one day can be put back on the table because we cannot only organize uh, uh, women's World Cups in Europe uh, and, and uh, uh, in uh, North America and in, and in Asia. We are now going to Oceania as well. We have to go to South America. We'll have to go to Africa as well with these events. But if you have to wait four years all the time, maybe, it's a bit long. So something more for us to think about. Let's try to go back to Thomas Smithis in Australia to see if we hear them. Um, Thomas, can you hear us? Uh, I can. Can you hear me this time? Yes, this time we can, so please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, you said uh, members of the council have different reasons for voting the way they did. What specifically were your reasons for voting for Australia and New Zealand? I studied carefully the files 
Uh, I, uh, it was a difficult decision, uh, of course, uh, for me, but it's our responsibility when you are elected um, in the council, when you are elected as FIFA president, you need to assume the responsibility when you have to assume it. It is difficult for a FIFA president to choose, of course, between uh, one or the other of the members of FIFA, because for me they are all obviously equal. I love Colombia as well, and I'm sure that they would have been able to organize a fantastic tournament. But at the end of the day, we have to look and analyze uh, the bits. And that's what I did. I studied it. We were criticizing. You were criticizing. Well, I was criticizing as well, but you, uh, FIFA in the past, for not giving enough attention to the technical evaluation, to the technical report. Well, we showed it for the 2026 men's bit. We showed it again for the uh, 2023 women's bit that these reports have to mean something because otherwise we have to stop organizing biddings and we just appoint someone based on a vote based on other criteria so obviously the technical report will have to be taken into account um, as as an important um, um, as an important element in order to assess the decision it was not the case in the old FIFA, while well, it is the case in the new FIFA, I am proud of that. Well, we have time for one last question on the, this particular topic of FIFA Women's World Cup. Uh, Simon Evans, Reuters. Simon, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Johnny, uh, two quick ones, if I can. Um, firstly, just, just going on back to that point you mentioned about, about technical reports and the transparency. I mean, the transparency is clear. We've all seen who voted for who. It's also clear that voting blocks, which is something that used to be criticised a lot in the in the old FIFA, as you call it, um, still existing there. Were you surprised to see block a block voting against the technical report, all of the federations? And the second one, obviously the negative side of the good news is that, is that somebody's lost. South America has never had the Women's World Cup. How, what does it have to do to get one and uh, how important is it for FIFA for the women's game to really take off on that continent? Um, well, I, I, I believe uh, South America should have a Women's World Cup, definitely. Definitely uh, South America should have one uh, in the near future. That's why maybe the, the, the World Cup every two years is a good option in this respect because with a World Cup you can really boost um, women's football in a continent which is football crazy like uh, uh, like South America. Uh, let's not forget that uh, uh, in addition to Colombia, also Brazil had submitted uh, a bit. Uh, I understand a very, very uh, competitive bit as well. Uh, obviously, Brazil has hosted uh, recently the Men's World Cup, so it's clear that they could also host the Women's World Cup. So could Colombia, because they were inside... Um, uh, the report. So we need to work on that. We need to work on South America being able to host such a big event. We need to work on Africa being able to host a women's World Cup as well. And again, if every time we have to wait for four years, maybe this is too much. But the same goes for the continental competitions, by the way. They are also taking place in many parts of the world only every four years. And we have seen that what works with women's football is the event, whether it's a World Cup, whether it's a a Euro, whether it's an Asian Cup, whatever, the events are working. So we need to foster these kind of, of competitions all over the world to make sure that everyone can have the opportunity to host and to boost. Um, as to the, uh, to the, to the blocks, uh, I was surprised. Yes, I was surprised. So thank you very much. Uh, this concludes the first part of our press conference, thanking, of course, Fatma Samora and Colin Smith for having been here. And uh, I would uh, pass the floor again to the FIFA president uh, for him to take us through the decisions, the other important decisions that were taken today by the FIFA Council. OK. So thanks also from my side to Fatma and Colin for the work done. <clears throat> now, as to the other decisions which uh, uh, 
which were taken, equally important ones. Um, the first one I would like to mention is uh, that the FIFA Council unanimously approved the COVID-19 relief plan, which means that FIFA is making available 1.5 billion US dollars for this COVID relief plan. Um, I would just like to go through with you the main points of this plan and then the other decisions which were taken about the international match calendar and the revised budget, for example. But let's focus for a moment on the COVID-19 relief plan. I'm proud that uh, the FIFA Council unanimously approved this FIFA COVID-19 relief plan which was uh, designed uh, by the FIFA administration in close cooperation with representatives of all confederations. Across uh, three different stages, the global support plan will make available, as I said, 1.5 billion US dollars to assist the football community all over the world. In the first two stages of the plan, FIFA uh, provided, in particular, for uh, the immediate release of all forward, so forward operational cost payments to member associations, and subsequently, this was stage one, stage two, for the opportunity to transform forward development grants into COVID-19 operational relief funds, provided, however, that 50% of this 50% of this, this corresponds, this is an amount of potentially 2 million per association. So 1 million of these 2 million would have to be invested in women's football. The third stage, which was approved today by the Council, um, gives and provides further support. I think I, it's important to go in through the detail because it's a very important plan. And it is a system of grants and loans. As to the grants, there is a universal solidarity grant of 1 million US dollar, which will be made available to all 211 member associations. And an additional grant of half a million US dollars, 500,000, which will be allocated again specifically to women's football. In addition to this, each confederation of the six will receive a grant of 2 million US dollars. This is the grant part. We have then a loan part as well, and this is something new that we are doing. Loans, at least in a serious way. Loans, uh, with the loans, member associations will be able to apply for interest-free loans amounting to up to 35% of their audited annual revenues. In interest of solidarity, a minimum loan amount of 500,000 US dollars and the maximum loan amount of uh, 5 million has been approved. In addition, each confederation will receive 4 million or has the possibility to access an interest-free loan of 4 million US dollars. Both grants and loans can be uh, directed by member associations to the wider football community. That's important as well in their respective territories, including clubs, players, leagues, or others that have been affected. Because the situation is different all over the world. And uh, we need to take this, of course, into account. It's important, of course, when we design such a plan, such an important plan, that we care about the governance model as well. So to ensure that uh, there is a, an effective and efficient oversight of the plan, there will be a strict control on the use of the funds. There will be audit requirements. Everything will be audited centrally, as well as clear loan repayment conditions, clear loan 
repayment conditions. A FIFA COVID-19 Relief Plan Steering Committee will be established to supervise the administration of this scheme. And in this respect, we have appointed, uh, uh, or Mr. Oli Rehn has been appointed. Mr. Oli Rehn is a deputy chairman of uh, the FIFA Governance Committee, so by the Governance Committee itself. He is also the governor of the Bank of Finland and the member of the Governing Council of the European Central Bank. And Mr. Oli Rehn is also a former vice president of the European Commission, in addition to being a football fan, of course. So it is in safe hands, in independent hands, in good hands, in expert hands. As a, a next step, the principles of this plan will be consolidated in a set of um, regulations and they will then be approved by the Bureau of the Council in the next few weeks. Uh, this is the first point. The second point that I wanted to mention is a revised budget, which obviously we had to look into due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis as well. Uh, a revised budget for next year, 2021, but also for the whole four-year cycle, 19 to 22. The good news in this respect is that um, uh, we will, at the end of the four-year cycle, be on exactly the same level, 100 million um, plus, as uh, was planned, because whilst, of course, due to the crisis and due to the situation, due to the decisions we had to take, revenues are going a little bit down, we are able to reduce costs as well and generate other revenues that make us uh, be still in a very solid situation and afford as well the relief package that I said, which is possible only thanks to the very, 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 very healthy financial situation of FIFA. The last point, or the, no, the third point I wanted to mention is the international match calendar for men's uh, uh, competitions. Also there, you know, in some countries you play, in others you don't. It's a very complicated situation and the men's international match calendar adds an additional complication because uh, in one country you can play in the other not if you play national teams it is per, per definition between countries so we need to have this into take this into account what we have decided is first of all to move the intercontinental playoffs for the fifa world cup 2022 from march 22 to june 22. We decided to postpone the September 20 window for four out of the six confederations, for AFC, CAF, CONCACAF, and OFC. We decided to proceed with the September 2020 window as planned for Comnebol and UEFA, obviously subject to continued monitoring of the situation. We decided to extend uh, the October 2020 and November 2020 windows by one day for Europe, for UEFA, in order to facilitate the playing of three games instead of two uh, in this period. And we also decided to extend the June 21 window by seven days for AFC, CAF, CONCACAF and UFC, so that they can play four games instead of the current two games in a period where uh, South America and Europe are playing their final tournament. We have created a working group, a FIFA Confederations working group in this respect. We are also uh, having a working group with the stakeholders and we'll continue on this monitoring the situation in each confederation all over the world, discussing alternative solutions if required. Let's hope not, but you never know. And uh, obviously, if anything needs to be adapted, changed, amended, reproposed, then it will go back to the Council. Furthermore, the Council also, the FIFA Council supported a Pan-Arab tournament to be played in 2021. It will be an invitational competition for men's national team that will be contested by Arab nations from Africa and from Asia. It will involve home-based players, 
being played outside of the international match calendar, so there is no release obligation in this respect. It is a friendly tournament. Uh, it's a tournament which will be held in Qatar from the 1st to the 18th of December 2021. It will be delivered by uh, the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 LLC and will allow, obviously, the organizers to use the facilities to run the operations that are planned for the World Cup in 2022. It will be one year before. It's a test event. It's a nice event, a pan-Arab competition to celebrate uh, Arab football uh, one year before the World Cup in um, Qatar. Um, the Council also has approved uh, the regulations for the Olympic tournament. There will be VAR and the age um, limit for the eligibility will stay as it was if the tournament would have been taking place in uh, the summer of this year. We have also uh, approved a proposal that will go to the Congress to amend the FIFA regulations governing the application of the statutes in terms of change of uh, nationality or eligibility to play for national teams to give and award a little bit more flexibility, albeit maintaining some strict um, criteria. And uh, finally, we also have approved the new FIFA anti-doping regulations to be in line with uh, the new uh, WADA code. Uh, they will come into force on the 1st of January of next year. Having said this, uh, the next council meeting will take place in September, just before the Congress, which will also be an online, a virtual Congress by video conference. Sorry for having been long, but it was... Uh, quite some time and we had to take quite some important uh, decisions as you have seen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So we will now accept uh, questions on these topics, uh, appreciating that uh, when given the opportunity, you ask uh, one question only in order to uh, give the possibility to as many colleagues as possible to ask their questions. Also letting you know that we were joined by the FIFA Deputy General Secretary on the football branch, uh, Matthias Grafström, and the FIFA uh, Chief Legal and Compliance Officer, Emilio Garcia Silveiro, in case there are some technical and specific questions being asked. When it comes to questions, uh, we will start where we left, uh, if I'm not mistaken, by Simon Evans, Reuters. Hello, Simon, again. Can you hear us? Yes, can hear you loud and clear, yeah. Just one question from me, yeah. Um, Long list there. Let me ask about something that wasn't mentioned. Uh, Club World Cup, obviously postponed given all the COVID complications. What's the latest thinking on, on when that tournament might be played? Thanks for the question. Um, the latest on the, on the Club World Cup is that it will be the most fantastic competition ever uh, to be organised. But we don't know yet when. Uh, I think it's important uh, that uh, to realise that we had um, fixed a slot for this Club World Cup, which was in uh, June and early July of uh, 2021, which was a FIFA reserved slot originally or previously for the Confederations Cup, which we uh, transformed into a Club World Cup, abolishing the old Club World Cup. We should just, remind, just say this as a reminder because... Uh, um, it is, uh, I think, also there unique that uh, uh, a governing body is reducing the number of competition it has, which is what we had proposed with this Club World Cup. Now, in order to show solidarity to those who needed it at this particular time, due to this severe crisis that we had, um, we agreed to move this Club World Cup in order to free this FIFA time, which was there in the summer of next year, to free it for um, Europe and South America for them to be able to postpone their final tournaments by one year. We uh, are also monitoring, like everyone, the situation currently of the world. We are not, uh, uh, in this respect, putting pressure because we know that the decision to host this Club World Cup has been decided. We are analyzing what is the best option. Is it 21 later on? Is it 22? Is it 23? 
uh, can it be a different way or, or something else? Um, Everything is open. What is important and what was important for me, for FIFA, for all other confederations as well in this particular period was to help those who needed uh, the help. We have seen as well that when it comes to the international match calendar, next year in June, we can add a few days for the other confederations as well because national team football is vital for many, um, many, many associations around the world and so will be the new Club World Cup will be vital for the sustainable development of club football all over the world for the solidarity that can be done with that so uh, i hope that uh, soon uh, we will be able to announce uh, decide and announce when this will take place but uh, at this moment in time um, the priorities were others and we need to help where we need to help because we are in a very healthy situation we can afford that Question now from uh, Agence France Presse again, uh, uh, Eric Bernardo. Eric, do you hear us? Hello? Yes. Yes. Bonsoir. Oh, bonsoir. Go ahead, please. President, uh, the amount we just announced of 1.5 billion to help the uh, association is, is massive. It means you will take some money from the FIFA reserves, first point, how much? And second point, you have now a global view of the uh, state of the global football in the world. How would you describe the situation? Are some clubs, are some associations in a real threat? Thank you very much. Uh, yes and yes. Uh, yes, um, some clubs are in, uh, and some associations are in a, in a real threat situation. Uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, in many parts of the world um, the peak has even not been reached or uh, football has not been able to resume yet and there is very, very little visibility on when this can, when this can happen. So we hope and we think that with this plan we can help a little bit. Uh, obviously, uh, you say rightly, 1.5 billion is a huge, huge amount. But when you have to uh, in distribute this to help all over the world, then it becomes, of course, much smaller, even though it is important for many. Let's not forget that uh, the vast majority of our member associations is surviving thanks to national team football as well. Uh, now, national team football has not been happening around the world since uh, November of last year. It's a long time. And uh, the whole of football in certain countries, in the, again, in the majority of countries, depends on these, uh, these payments. So we need to, be, to continue to be vigilant, to continue to help, to continue to, to assist. And this COVID relief plan goes in this, um, in this direction. What was the first part of the question? The reserves, yes, 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 of course. Of course, we had to take uh, part of it um, from the reserves. You will have all the details about that. One part uh, is, uh, I don't have them now in front of me, but one part is uh, uh, reallocation, so to say, of the forward funds already budgeted, um, as I was saying before. The other part, the grants and the loans, uh, around 800 million, I think. So if you all speak, I cannot hear you. 328.5 for the grants. So 328.5 for the grants. This is coming from the reserves. And, and 556 million for loans. Also and 556 million for the loans is also coming from the reserves. So I was not so bad with my 800 plus million coming from the reserves. Thank you very much. Uh, next in line, uh, Robert Harris, Associated Press. Again, uh, Rob, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me OK? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi there. Hi. Um, hope all are, are well. Um, Shay Fatma isn't there. It would have been, I'd be quite like to ask her a question, um, particularly obviously in light of the uh, strong footballing um, solidarity of the Black Lives Matter movement and to discover particularly how FIFA is planning to go beyond hashtags and T-shirts to, um, to pursue making football more diverse um, in general. I mean, I don't know. You want to, want to answer that? I, you know, it'd be good to ask uh, Fatma. Um, but in, in the absence of that, questions on the Middle East. 
Since we've lost the chance to speak to you, new troubling details have emerged from the US Department of Justice announcing alleged bribes paid by FIFA executive committee members to secure votes for Qatar in the 2022 World Cup vote. You've also got Nasser Al Khalifa going on trial on a separate matter. How concerned are you and how do you protect yourselves in your dealings with Qatar, given the ongoing allegations? And on the other side of the, the Gulf, after the WTO report on Saudi Arabian broadcast piracy, which FIFA has demanded action is taken against. At the moment, would you as FIFA reject any Saudi state investment? And if you were a league, would you allow the Saudi sovereign wealth fund to take over a club? I'm, I'm happy to be a FIFA president and not a league, uh, as, as, uh, to, to take your last, um, your last question. But I, well, I, didn't, I hope somebody took note of all the questions you asked, because I, I have to say I lost uh, uh, track a little bit. Um, first of all, on... Uh, on the racism um, issue, I mean, uh, we have in FIFA, and these are not just words, as you know, um, clear stance of zero tolerance against racism, also against violence. We have made this position very clear in the last uh, few weeks, again. Um, we are living this every day in our job, in our function, by involving everyone, by increasing the number of teams participating, by creating uh, Club World Cups, which are criticized by some, uh, because suddenly you open the world. We opened uh, the number of teams participating in the men's World Cup, in the women's World Cup, to have more representatives, because it is nice to speak, as you say, and make some hashtags and, and, and make some declarations, but then nothing follows. Nothing follows. Our council, our administration is 100 million times more diverse than before. It's easy for many to uh, uh, say certain things, to say no to racism, but then, no to racism, but stay in your country, right? No to racism, but don't bother me. No to racism, but let me do my thing and you stay uh, where you are. Well, we are opening. We are an open organization, we are a democratic organization, we are a tolerant organization, and we live this every day. So besides the hashtags and besides uh, the declarations and besides uh, the fact of uh, uh, having a clear position as well when it comes to how anyone who has a voice can express this, always in a respectful way, of course, but in a clear way as well, um, we are living it every day of, uh, of our life with all the activities we, we are doing, and we are thinking and planning ahead as well some other initiatives of which you will hear soon. It's not yet the time to uh, mention these. Exactly. We, we are working as well on the disciplinary. We, we did it last year. Exactly. Of course, they remind me, you're right, we changed the disciplinary code uh, last year to foresee much harsher sanctions for uh, racism. And we are asking everyone, all confederations, all associations, everyone who is organizing competitions to introduce these changes as well. Because we can put the framework, but we cannot oblige certain uh, changes to happen at national level. There must be the will to do that. We are working, uh, yes, uh, of course, with, with, with the players in this respect, with the legends, but also uh, with still active players to see what more, how more um, we can do in order to uh, uh, really kick out racism of football, of society, but not just in words, but really in actions and, uh, and facts. I think we are showing this. Um, every day. This sometimes brings us uh, also not uh, only uh, friends, but we have, um, we have to do that. Then, DOJ indictments and relations with, uh, with Qatar. Well, there, is, uh, there are ongoing proceedings as well. These are legal matters that, uh, um, that are dealt with, of course, as well by, by our lawyers. Um, we are supporting as FIFA, at FIFA every investigation on alleged criminal acts everywhere in um, uh, the world. We are cooperating everywhere in the world with the 
state authorities. We are following everything. We uh, will see what kind of information will be made available in addition to the indictment that you have seen. If you look at this indictment, uh, you, you will see that I think all the names which are mentioned there are persons which have already been sanctioned, including with live bands by, um, by FIFA. So I think uh, this is taken into account. Now, the, with ifs and whens and what, if and what, when, uh, this is something I've never been uh, speaking about and I will certainly not uh, do that. We are and have to prepare um, for a World Cup in 2022 in Qatar. This was decided 10 years ago in 2010, <clears throat> before, well before my time. We are now here to organize uh, the World Cup uh, as successful as we did in, in Russia two years ago. So moving forward, uh, Alex Kapstick, BBC. Alex, do you hear us? Uh, I can hear you, yes. Good evening. Hello, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just to return to the Club World Cup, um, are you still, how are you getting on with your search for a, for a backer for that event? And is it viable without the proper investment? Uh, definitely it is viable. Um, it is not only viable, it will be... Um, uh, successful, and we are not looking for a for a backup. Uh, we are looking for, uh, uh, of course, partners, commercial partners who can uh, uh, help making this event a big a big success. Now, obviously, I mean, we were in the middle of the of a, of a, of a process there, and uh, when the pandemic started, and when we had to decide to postpone again, for solidarity reasons with the rest of the world to postpone this uh, club World Cup. When we'll have a new date, we will resume, we'll go back to the market. And from what we have seen from the first round of uh, uh, talks uh, that were held by our commercial department, I mean, the interest was very big. But it's obvious that it's very big because just imagine, I mean, the biggest clubs in the world playing for... Uh, uh, 18 days or 15 or 17, whatever it will be, in uh, uh, one place to crown the world champion. I think this is, uh, this is a very, very appealing um, event and uh, I'm sure it will be, and we are sure it will be very successful. Next question coming from the New York Times, Tariq Panja. Tariq, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, Johnny, hi. Nice to see you after um, such a, a long time. Um, just a question about uh, what's been in the German and Swiss media over the last, I don't know, a couple of months. There seems to be a story every week about this um, Swiss prosecutor, etc. So can I, can I just ask, just within that, it's been five years since... Um, the events of May 25th, 2015. There hasn't been a single prosecution in Switzerland. Do you have confidence in the Swiss authorities to deal with these issues from the past? And second, secondly, your role, the um, Attorney General, Mr Lauber, seems to be in a bit of a pickle, and it seems to be related to these meetings he's had with you. Do you now remember what you met and talked to him about? Is that something you'd like to clarify, given all these stories? Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Eric, for for uh, asking this uh, uh, question. Um, I have to say that, uh, um, well, first to your first question, we need to have confidence in in the justice. I mean, otherwise we have to stop living uh, in a in a in a in our civilized world. So this is this is the first part. The second part, or the second question. Um, I have to say that for a long time, obviously, uh, in particular myself, I didn't uh, really speak about that because for me, this whole thing is quite absurd. So let me clarify this once and for all. To meet with the prosecutor, with the head prosecutor, chief prosecutor or the attorney general of uh, Switzerland, 
is uh, perfectly legitimate and it's perfectly legal. It's no violation of anything. On the contrary, it is also part of the fiduciary duties of the president of FIFA. If you uh, remember, and unfortunately we are still dealing with some of these things, um, when I was elected, we are speaking about four years ago, for the first time, FIFA was uh, involved as a damaged party, as victim in more than 20 proceedings. There was a mountain of uh, questions. So it is legitimate to contribute or to offer to contribute and then to contribute as well to the Swiss Attorney General um, about the clarification of these events, hoping that uh, those who have done criminal acts will be held into account for that. What I have to uh, add as well is that what is bothering me a little bit is uh, that uh, some of the wording about you know secret meetings or there is nothing secret. There can be nothing secret when you meet a prosecutor in a civilized country. The guarantee for that is obviously uh, the prosecutor himself. So I am certainly not entering into Swiss politics and what is what is happening uh, in Switzerland, but. Uh, um, we are uh, happy and proud always of being co of cooperating with the Swiss authorities, as we do with the authorities all over the world. You are in America, uh, Tariq, you know that FIFA is collaborating, has collaborated, is collaborating with the DOJ. And this has led to, I don't know how many, 20, 30 uh, um, uh, decisions by, by the criminal courts. We are meeting prosecutors everywhere in the world. This doesn't seem to be a problem anywhere in the world. Uh, except in this beautiful country. But we have to fight and we have to continue, of course, to fight. To fight, and I just want to, to say this, to fight for what? To fight to come back to the situation we have today in FIFA, where if you read the financial report, you know every dollar where it went and where it came from. You come to today's meeting where a host of a World Cup is decided in a bidding process which has no equal in the world, in a transparent, in a professional, in a competitive bidding process. We did the same for the 2026 World Cup. And of course, to do these things, to change this culture, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy. Those who don't want change, they fight against it. There we are. I'm proud of what we have achieved. I'm proud of what we are doing. Because this is exactly the fair play that I stand for. Thank you. We have some more requests in line. Um, Jamie Gardner, the Press Association. Jamie, can you hear us? Are you online, Jamie? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Um, just a question for Gianni um, on player fatigue. Um, FIFA Pro put something out last week um, raising concerns about um, congested calendar, which was looking fairly congested before the pandemic and extremely so now. Um, are you concerned that all these in extra international dates and club commitments are going to put players in a, a fairly risky position in terms of injuries? Obviously, we are concerned. We are concerned about the health of, um, of the players. We need to uh, study this very, very carefully. We are studying this particular question as well in, in our stakeholders um, working group, including uh, FIFA Pro. We have decided uh, to give the option, for example, uh, of the five substitutions in this particular period, again, because we care about the health of, um, of the players. Um, I know I don't think the problem is uh, the national teams or the clubs, or because everyone, of course, thinks on himself and his own situation. Our role as at FIFA is to try to bring everyone around the table and find 
the best uh, solutions. Uh, maybe nobody will be happy at the end with that solution, which means that uh, everyone has something in return. But the key, I mean, in this, in this pandemic period, we have all realized that health is important. It is the most important thing, much more important than football. When we come to football, the health of the players is very important. So we need to analyze this. Again, five substitutions is going into this direction. Uh, what we agreed at the last IFAB meeting as well, the test for concussion substitutions as well. This is coming up also. We need to think, and I said this publicly as well, uh, about is there a maximum number of games that can be played then if you play one minute or 90 minutes, it's also a difference. But we need to think about all these things in a very serious way now that we are looking as well at the new international match calendar. So a question from DPA Germany, Florian Lutica. Florian, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Infantino, um, uh, I have a similar question to my colleague Tariq. Um, there was also a um, process in Switzerland regarding uh, the World Cup 2006 when there was no judgment because of uh, coronavirus. Uh, the German Federation has announced that they want to do their own investigation into it. Um, what uh, do you think of it and how can FIFA help uh, in this uh, process? And if you allow a real quick second one, uh, when will the draw for the World Cup 2022 take place now? Thank uh, you. The draw for the World Cup 2022 will take place in early April. early April 22, yes. Yes. Or are you asking for the preliminary? Maybe. Anyway, the draw for the World Cup is taking place in April 22. Uh, for the preliminary, it is taken before they start. <laughs> yeah, uh, the confederations will propose us. It should be early December of this year, because then for Europe, because then uh, the, 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 they will take place next year. Uh, when it comes to the 2006 uh, summer Märchen uh, uh, process that uh, was uh, concluded uh, in a sad way, yes, of course, we are not happy. Um, about that, this is one thing. How can we help and contribute? Well, however we can, in whichever way uh, anyone uh, wants uh, our help and our assistance to clarify these things, obviously, we are there. Uh, if the process has not been concluded uh, um, in Switzerland because of time uh, reasons, it doesn't mean that such a process cannot take place, maybe in other countries. From our side as well, I say this very, very, very clearly. It's, we are not going to sit down and say, OK, nothing happened. Because 10 million Swiss francs at the time, I think, were paid out of a FIFA account, even though it was many, many years ago, much earlier than uh, I became FIFA president. This is something we cannot just sit still and not accept. So, of course, we will continue to uh, uh, analyze this. Uh, we have our ethics bodies as well who are looking uh, into this in some time. Um, obviously, they were all waiting, I think, as well on, on the outcome of, um, of, the, of the Swiss criminal process. But uh, the story has not finished. And uh, we will not accept, even if it concerns the past, that uh, 10 million can just be going out without a proper reason. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I do apologize. We had uh, more requests uh, in line, but it's uh, over an hour now at our press conference. So uh, I think uh, we should come to an end. Appreciate your time once more and uh, see you soon, hopefully in person one day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.